Casey, thank you. O day of peace that dimly shines through all our hopes and prayers and dreams. Guide us to justice, truth, and love delivered from our selfish schemes. This is perhaps a, a song that uh, you're not familiar with. It's a relatively new hymn called O Day of Peace That Dimly Shines. It was written only 40 years ago, so it's brand spanking new in hymnody. Um, I love that opening phrase, O Day of Peace That Dimly Shines. Have you ever been in a place where the day of peace dimly shined in your life? Where you, you, you knew it was out there, perhaps. You knew it was on the horizon. You, you can maybe just see the beginnings of the dawn breaking, but it, it dimly shone because darkness was still overwhelmingly abundant. I think about in times in my life when the anxieties or, or, or the fears or maybe even the, the hopelessness begins to feel overwhelming. Have you ever felt that way? Or maybe you do right now. What about for us as a people when the day of peace, this hope and prayer, this justice, truth, and love, when it dimly shines for us as a collective people? I wonder if many of us feel that way this week after we were reminded of the epidemic of gun violence in our schools, 21, 21 issues of gun violence in our schools since August the 1st, 21. Day of peace dimly shines. Maybe you're watching with bated breath as the Supreme Court appears to be set to send reproductive rights back in time a half a century. Day of peace dimly shines. Or even more locally here in Richardson and North Dallas, we're discovering that those who attempt to teach a more full understanding of historic or perpetual racism will get teachers and administrators attacked as sowing seeds of division and corrupting the minds of our youth. The day of peace dimly shines. We're in this series called the Songs of Advent, and if you're, you're not familiar, Advent is a season in the Christian calendar that precedes Christmas. And culturally, we're not good at Advent because Advent is about waiting. It's about sitting in darkness. It's about acknowledging the chaos and the fear that so frequently accompanies life in this world. It's all the moments up until the birth of Christ. And then we have Christmas time. But no, we, we can't have Advent. Instead, we need to have Santa Claus uh, and, and movies like Home Alone and all the stuff that I love. Let's be clear. I've, I've watched them all, and I'm all about Christmas spirit. And yet Advent is this liturgical season that invites us into something different. Perhaps something at first that feels uncomfortable. You're like, man, this is a downer way to start a sermon during the Christmas season, Pastor Scott. And yet if we, if we look closely, when we look at Scripture, we'll find that the story around Christmas is a combination of joy and pain. It's a combination of celebration and lament. It's a combination of hope and fear. That's what this Christmas and Advent season is all about. And so we're singing songs of Advent this Advent season at AUMC. And, and we're looking at scriptures that, um, that also, in many cases, contain songs themselves. Today's scripture comes to us from the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. And we're going to read the words of a man named Zechariah and the song of Advent that he has to share. But before we do that, I want to tell you a little bit about Zechariah. Zechariah was a, a priest he was an elderly priest. He and his wife Elizabeth were, were past the childbearing age, and they had no children. And in those days, that would have been um, a really difficult burden for them to have. As, as people culturally, that would have been very difficult for them to live with, especially and especially with Zechariah being a priest. There may have even been some, some shame that came upon that. Perhaps they were not as righteous would have been the thought at the time. Zechariah is a, an elderly priest, and he's going to the temple to, to perform his priestly duties. 
And he's greeted by the presence of God in the form of an angel. Angel Gabriel appears to him and says, guess what? You are going to have a child, and not just a child, but a son. And Zechariah does not believe this angel. It sounds a lot like if you're familiar with the story of Abraham and Sarah. Again, elderly couple past the childbearing age, don't think kids are in their future. And then the presence of God visits and says, guess what? You're going to have a child, and not just a child, but a son. Abraham doesn't believe. Zechariah doesn't believe. But Zechariah is then rendered mute by the angel can't speak. For nine months, he can't speak. The best nine months of Elizabeth's life. <laughs> he comes out of the temple, and people know that something's happened. They can see it in his eyes. There's something they can tell going on, but all he can do is pantomime, do some charades. No one knows what's going on. They're the talk of the town, right? Can you believe what's happened to Zechariah? And then their son is born. We see this story of Elizabeth giving birth, and then on the eighth day, when their son is to be circumcised, they ask for the name, and Elizabeth tries to say John, but of course all the men in the room say, no, 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 we're not asking you. Let's ask the dad. What's the son's name? And John takes out a tablet and writes, his name is John. You can like hear him underscoring that name in the scripture. And as soon as he writes down the name, it says his mouth is opened, his tongue is unleashed, and he begins to praise God. And then we read this song that Zechariah has to offer. Elizabeth has birthed John, and now Zechariah is about to birth a prophecy, a Holy Spirit moment, you could say. And it comes to us in the form of a song. If you've got your Bibles with you, if you want to read along, it's in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 68. Zechariah says this, "'Blessed be the Lord God of Israel.'" For God has looked favorably on God's people and redeemed them. God has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of God's servant David. As God spoke through the mouth of God's holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus God has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered God's holy covenant, the oath that God swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness before God all of our days. We're going to stop there for now. You'll notice I never said the word peace. That word is coming. But I want to stop here because Zechariah's song is broken up into sort of two different parts. This first part is original to the Gospel of Luke. Now, I'm going to share this not to get us distracted, but more that it's important to know the context of where our Scripture comes from. This song is actually two parts. One part was written by Luke, and, and one part probably wasn't, and that's okay. <laughs> Learning more about Scripture doesn't undo the holiness of Scripture. It simply helps us know more about Scripture. Amen? So Luke's gospel included this original song, and you'll notice this is not so much about John as we're listening. These are really words about Jesus. Zechariah is sharing this sort of prophetic Holy Spirit word about who Jesus is, what Jesus has come to do. Jesus is that incarnate mercy and love of God, this long-promised conclusion to the story of the Jewish people. To understand why this is important, we need to understand where Luke's gospel comes from. The gospel of Luke was written sometime after the year 72. And the reason we know this, 72, I'm sorry, CE, not um, the more recent one, 72 CE. Uh, the reason that date is important is that's the date when the temple fell in Jerusalem. That's like the temple that you hear referenced in the Bible, the temple that you can now still go to the Western Wall of, even though it's fallen, there's the Western Wall, the famous Western Wall. That's the temple. It falls in 72 in the midst of, in the midst of battle, and um, immediately it sends the Jewish people into a bit of an identity crisis because for centuries their faith had been founded literally on this sacred place. This was the, the, the space that not just physically but also spiritually grounded and centered the Jewish people. It helped give them an enormous sense of identity as God's chosen people. So when the temple falls, there's this huge question of who are we now? And Luke writes his gospel in part to make a case that the Jewish people are meant to follow after this Messiah named Jesus. And oh, by the way, let me tell you about him, Luke says. 
So this temple has fallen, war is breaking out, the Jewish people are experiencing oppression and and struggling with who they are as God's people. And and this portion of the song is written by Luke, and and it makes a plain case that Jesus is this realized promise. He's trying to offer some sense of peace to the Jewish people to say, Jesus is this realized promise of God's love for Israel that began with our ancestors like Abraham. Abraham. But then Luke is going to show us that this promise is not just for the people of Abraham, but but for truly all the world. Luke's gospel continues and goes on to be a, a gospel really written for the outsider and the outcast, those who are marginalized and oppressed. So after there's this initial set of verses that that are original to Luke, then we get a second set of verses. And some Bibles even have sort of a break in in the text because scholars pretty well agree that this next portion did, did not come from Luke's pen but was likely a later edition. And this has to do with John, Zechariah's son. He says in verse 76, And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to to give knowledge of salvation to God's people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, let us say, thanks be to God. So these words were likely part of an early hymn that was sung by the followers of John, who had become John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was a very famous prophet and preacher uh, before Jesus' public ministry. He was also Jesus' older cousin, right? Um, Jesus was trying to live up to older cousin John the Baptist. He did pretty good, I think. Um, John the Baptist had quite the following. You know, today we have thought leaders and speakers that will generate huge followings and fill stadiums. The same was true back then. John had that kind of a following that went with him. And he was celebrated and venerated in that first century and and, and long into um, the the future of the early Christian movement. And, And these words were from a hymn that were meant to celebrate and identify John's role in the in the messianic age, this one who comes before and prepares the way of the Lord. And I love that closing line in Zechariah's song. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us. This is not any longer a a day of peace that is dimly shining. The the dawn is breaking in. The light is piercing through, it says, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The way of peace. That word peace in the Greek is the word erene. Irene is a Greek word that that is very similar to the Hebrew word shalom, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. This concept of, we see it as the word peace, but it's it's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's a a peace not born of of simply ceasefire, but a peace that is born of, of wholeness, of completeness, of oneness with yourself, with your community, with your God, right? That's what Irene is. It's so much more than the word peace. In the shadow of death, it says, this this peace that Luke preaches about is is not simply a a ceasefire between opposing sides. It's not that the the darkness and the light learn how to get along. It's not that, that evil and sin and goodness and righteousness decide to lay down their arms, but instead it's a light breaking through. It's life bursting into death. That's the kind of peace, the kind of wholeness, the kind of oneness, this movement towards life and light and love of God. Sometimes we mistake peace as passivity or being meek and mild, rolling over like a doormat. That's not the way of John, and it's not the way of Jesus. This is something bigger, something better. Luke and Zechariah and the, and the ancestors of ages past are calling us to wage peace in the land of death. Peace is an active word something we set our feet to and set our lives to. We are being called to wage peace in the land of death. Darkness and sin and death are those things which which separate and divide us from ourselves, us from each other, us from God. And peace, Zechariah says, 
is that which makes the many one. And we're going to find peace by setting our attention to this little child named John. Zechariah says that John's going to show us what it means to walk the path of peace. John's going to be the one to show us what light and life and love look like. Doesn't that sound nice? Don't you want to meet this man who's going to lead us in the path of peace? Here's John's first words. This is the way that Luke introduces us to John in chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. So John's got this crowd gathered around him. They've come to be baptized. Again, he's a famous speaker and preacher and prophet. In verse 7 of chapter 3, it says, John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Merry Christmas, you filthy animals. <laughs> Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, John says, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. So let's just pause for a second. What he's saying is don't simply claim, well, I was raised in the faith. You know, I was born into this. I'm good to go, right? I mean, I, I sit in the pew every Sunday. John's saying, I don't care about any of that. God can make believers come out of these stones. If your life and faith don't have flesh, if they are not real, if they are not tangible, I don't want to hear about it. You don't get born into this. This is not something that we can just passively accept. No, there is something more, John said. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Pastor Scott, is he talking about the fiery depths of hell? No. Being thrown into the fire is to be annihilated, to be turned to ash, to just be nothing. What John is getting after is saying, if your faith does not bear fruit, if your faith does not become real, if your faith does not get into the mud and the dirt and the grit and the need of the world, if your faith is not with the outcast and the marginalized, with the widow and the orphan, as our faith has always told us to be, if your faith is not like that, it'll turn to ash. It'll eventually be nothing. It doesn't have any purpose in this world because you haven't made it real. God has been made real. Life is meant to be made real. Faith is meant to be made real. And anything less is just going to disappear over time. And so then the crowds ask him, what then should we do? Like, all right, preacher man, those are some harsh words. What do we do with this? What does it mean to walk in the way of peace, John? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. And then the soldiers also asked him, and we, what, what should we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages." So let's talk about each of those three responses that John gives, but let's start here. The path of peace must confront injustice. If we thought that the day of peace in Advent was simply about sitting idly by and receiving a day of rest and a day of passivity, we were gravely mistaken, my friends. The path of peace must confront injustice. To understand why, let's look at each of these examples that are given. Three examples, three different sets of people. Examples of how we are commonly divided amongst each other and from each other and how peace calls us to a different path. First, there's this crowd, the crowd. It's a crowd of, of Jewish people, right? That's who John is witnessing to. And they say, well, what should we do? And John's like, guys, this is not rocket science. Micah 6, 8, what have I required of you, says the Lord, right? It's been the same answer all the way along. Care for the widow, care for the orphan, care for the needy, care for the oppressed. If you've got two shirts, give one away because someone's naked. If you've got two plates of food, give one away because someone's hungry. This It's not that complicated. There's a scarcity mindset that sets in on all of us. It's what drives us to have a closet full of clothes while many go unhoused. It's what drives us to have not just plates full of food, but a, a trash can full of leftovers when many go hungry. It's a scarcity mindset that says, if I don't look after myself, then no one else is going to, and it creates divides of haves versus have-nots. But God, John says, invites us to see that there is plenty and to share. I've got a shirt. Here, have my second one. 
I've got a plate of food here. Have my leftovers. Have my second plate. Then the tax collectors say, oh, okay, okay, okay. That's good for them. Well, what about us? Now, tax collectors were, were a, a, a very specific set of people in the Jewish community. When Rome occupied the Jewish territory, they enlisted, they recruited basically members of the Jewish community to become tax collectors for their communities. So suddenly imagine if your, if your cousin Frankie started knocking on your door demanding money for Caesar. But the way that Frankie's making money is not just by collecting taxes, but by collecting above and beyond, right? So Caesar says, I need 30 denarii, and Frankie says, yeah, he needs 50. Yeah, it's going to be 50 this week. Thank you. Thank you, cousin. Love you. Hate you, Frankie, you know. Tax collectors were not respected. They were, they were enemies in the Jewish community. And so John looks to them, and he says, this selfishness that has taken root in your heart that leads you to take more than you need, and not just to take, but to take from your family, from your community, from your friends. Don't you see you're robbing your own pockets? God invites us to see, John says, that robbing one only hurts the whole. The path of peace continues to challenge those divides. And then there's the soldiers. This is where John has some chutzpah, yeah? I mean, the soldiers, these are Roman soldiers with like gladius in hand. What about us, right? And John looks at them with only the confidence that like a 28-year-old prophet can have, right? He says, don't cheat or harass anyone. Be satisfied with your wages. Don't extort through threat of violence. Can you imagine saying that to the occupying soldier in your territory? He says, there's a better way for you too. This power that you think you hold, that you hold over others, that you use the threat of fear and violence to, to make more for yourself, this, this power that you use to divide through fear and intimidation. See, God's inviting you and all of us to see that love is more dangerous, yes, but also more meaningful. See, a soldier was probably scared that if, if they didn't leverage their power for fear and for that worst version of respect, that maybe the people would rise up. And John's saying, maybe if you actually treated people with respect, we could have a better world. Crazy concept. John is addressing these three different groups of people, addressing three unique divides, the divide of scarcity, the divide of selfishness, and the divide of power. And John is calling them and calling us 2,000 years later to be a people that wage peace, to give like there's plenty to live like we are family, and to use our power for love. That's the path to wholeness, the path to oneness, the path to completion. It doesn't lead us through simple, you know, lion laying down with lamb kind of nonsense. This is stuff that takes grit. It takes chutzpah. It takes courage. It takes work. It takes getting down in the mud and the dirt and the grit and placing our hands with the people who need us and the feet set to walking in the places of need. That's the kind of path of peace that John is proclaiming. That's the way of the Lord. Here's the assurance that we're offered. It comes in the beginning of Zechariah's song. He says, God has granted that we would be rescued from the power of our enemies so that we could serve God without fear. The promise that we're given, the assurance that we're offered, that when we wage peace, when we wage peace, the battle is already won. Perhaps not in our day, perhaps not in our lifetime, but we are setting our lives and our faith to bear fruit that will last and not be thrown into the fire. Fruit that will matter for generations to come and a campaign for peace that ultimately will prove victorious. I am so tired of devoting my life to things that I know will waste away. I want my faith and my life to be about those things that I know will last, that will bear fruit and, 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 and sprout trees that my grandchildren will sit under and I may never enjoy. But that's the kind of life and faith, that's the kind of path of peace that John's calling us to walk. In closing, there's a story about Bishop Desmond Tutu that I think is appropriate. It was in the most troubling days of apartheid in South Africa and the government began to shut down political anti-apartheid rallies. And amid this persecution, Archbishop Desmond Tutu 
uh, declared that, the, that he would hold a church service instead of a political rally. I love that. It's not getting political, it's getting faithful. They held it at St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town, and the service attracted worship from all over South Africa. It's a John the Baptist kind of moment, yeah? It also attracted hundreds of police who surrounded the cathedral in a show of military intimidation. And as Bishop Desmond Tutu began preaching, the police entered the cathedral armed with guns and lined the walls. Some took out notebooks and began to write down Bishop Tutu's words. And he remained unintimidated. If you've ever heard him speak, you can picture this in your mind. At one point in his sermon, he turned to the police and he said this, you are powerful. You are very powerful. But you are not gods. And I serve a God who cannot be mocked. So since you have already lost, since you have already lost, I invite you to come and join the winning side. Chutzpah. My friends, behind me is a table that invites us to walk a path of peace and to know that waging peace means the victory is already won and we're invited to join the winning side, to give like there's plenty, to live like we're family, and to leverage our power for love, to find peace with ourselves with each other, and with our God. Amen.